Hey, welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery reporting for duty. China History Podcast, episode 262. Part four this time of yet another patented CHP miniseries in the making, this time featuring an overview of the history of the Thai Chinese people. We're only riding a horse and admiring these flowers, so to speak. No deep-sea diver suit required for this. Alexander Pope wrote in 1709, quote, A little learning is a dangerous thing, end quote. But he wasn't referring to Chinese history, I'm sure, where, if I may humbly say, a little learning is much better than no learning at all. So I hope you're enjoying this series up to now. The story keeps getting better, I assure you. Like all the histories of the worldwide Chinese diaspora, and especially in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of compelling and delightful history there to appreciate. And this is just a little of it. We'll focus today on the events of this tumultuous period that I'm sure all of us are already quite familiar with. This involves the well-known societal and national earthquakes that started happening in China right about mid-century that, unbeknownst to those living at that time, would still reverberate into the 2020s, two and a half centuries later. Last time we finished off with King Rama I overthrowing Taksin the Great, and this first Chakri dynasty king got to be the one to usher in the 19th century. So not to belabor this point, but again, Britain, the Netherlands, France, and others, well, they're going to have the time of their lives exploiting that military technology gap between themselves and the nation stretching from the China Seas to the Bay of Bengal, and though Siam famously never gets colonized to the extent that their neighbors did, they still got bullied by the European powers of the day and later on by the Japanese. Even in our trying times, no nation likes to get bullied by more powerful states. Well, it was the same back then. So if life deals you a handful of lemons, try turning them into lemonade. That's what happened in the case of Siam. We saw last episode how King Rama III signed the Bernie Treaty, June 1826, which uh, essentially, yeah, 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 the British, and promised to open the door to free trade and let them in and run amok, just like in China. The treaty sorted things out with Britain regarding the Siam-Malay border, but as far as busting the kingdom open to free trade, by the mid-1850s, The East India Company, in their final years, started to wonder, what happened to all that free trade negotiated in the Bernie Treaty? King Rama III had held them off at the pass, skillfully delaying the inevitable. Whilst buying time for the kingdom, he instituted a tax farming system that put many Chao Sua and Chao Mong, ethnic Thai Chinese elites with a lot of resources at their disposal, Well, they were put to good use making this new government revenue generating system work. And later on, I'm I'm going to come back to this uh, tax farming system. So the Siam Royal Court felt secure that when the day came where they had to finally open the kingdom up to free trade and all that royal trade monopoly money that they got to gorge themselves on for so long got siphoned off to the British and other foreign traders, well their losses would be covered by the new tax farming revenues. And that day when the British put their foot down finally did come, as they all knew it would. And the king of Siam, ruling in Bangkok, was Rama IV, King Mankut. My fellow Americanskis will remember this king as the one portrayed by the immortal Yul Brenner in The King and I. And the one tasked on behalf of Her Majesty's government with making this whole free trade thing happen was none other than Sir John Bowring, a well-known name to anyone who uses the Jordan MTR station in Yaomate, Bowring Street, a nice shortcut to Temple Street. So King Mankut, the fourth ruler of the Chakri dynasty, he reigned 1851-1868. That's contemporaneous with the Xianfeng and Tongzhi emperors over in the Qing Empire. John Bowring was serving at the time as not only the newly minted governor of Hong Kong, the fourth one. He also acted as plenipotentiary and superintendent of British trade in China with responsibility, among other places, for Siam. And when he showed up in April 1855, 
with two British warships and all that that implied. King Mankut, Rama IV, he signed the Bowering Treaty that, among other unsavory things for the kingdom, opened the country up to free trade with customs duties pegged at an agreed-upon rate. The old days were gone forever when swarms of these Chinese junks sailed back and forth between the ports of Siam and China, providing the lifeblood of the kingdom's merchant trade economy. They had become no competition for the European cargo ships with their massive size and all their new technologies. It totally changed the shipping paradigm in the South Seas. And then, after forcing this first unequal treaty on the kingdom of Siam... Bowering sailed off into the sunset, back to Hong Kong, and for an encore, he led the campaign against the Qing Empire in the Arrow War, better known as the Second Opium War, 1856 to 1860, culminating, of course, in the pillage of the Summer Palace and the Treaty of Peking, which, among other things, none good for China, legalized Chinese emigration. No more trying to bend the rules at your own risk. Let me quote something interesting from one of the main sources I've been referring to in this series, The History of the Thai Chinese, by Jeffrey Singh and Pimprafai Bisalputra. This is what John Bowring wrote of his observations about the Chinese when he was in Bangkok for the signing of the treaty which bears his name. Quote, It is estimated that in the kingdom of Siam, there were more than a million and a half Chinese settlers. In the city of Bangkok alone, there are supposed to be 200,000 In fact, all the active business appears to be in their hands. Nine out of ten of the floating bazaars, which cover for miles the two banks of the Mainan, are occupied by Chinamen. Very many of them are married to Siamese women, for a China woman scarcely ever leaves her country. But the children are invariably educated to the Chinese type. The Chinese not only occupied the busiest and largest bazaars, but their trading habits descend to the very lowest articles of barter, and hundreds of Chinese boats are vibrating up and down the river, calling at every house, penetrating every creek, supplying all articles of food, raiment, and whatever ministers to the daily wants of life. As a community, they are nearly isolated from the Siamese, though professing for the most part the same religion. They have their own temples and carry on their worship of Buddha, not according to the usages of the priests of Siam. The signs over their warehouses, shops, and houses are all written in Chinese. In the Chinese language, they carry on all their correspondence. Nor do I remember an example of a Chinaman being able to write, though they almost all speak the Siamese language. End quote. One of the upshots of all this free trade was that it gave a nice, big jolt to the economy. The Bowering Treaty turned Siamese trade, as they had always known it, on its head. But commerce in the kingdom was able to adapt to the new times quite quickly, and now, being part of the British-inspired free trade zone that extended from the trading ports of Europe to the entirety of Southeast Asia and India, what followed was prosperity the likes of which had never been seen before. And King Mankut, early on, looked in the direction of China, and saw a once great nation badly in need of a major rejuvenation. As soon as he became king, he wasted no time showing the Qing Empire the obeisance they demanded. A very respectable treasure trove of gifts were laden on board these junks to show the Manchu Qing Empire. King Mankut meant business. By the time the vessels arrived safely in Guangzhou. The Daoguang emperor had died, and they were still in the official mourning period. All that trouble for nothing. So the mission went nowhere. The king of Siam tried again the following year, this time with the Xianfeng emperor on the dragon throne, 1853. At last, this mission from Siam was able to offer tribute to the Qing emperor and enjoy being the beneficiary of political favor with the royal court. And in return for this solid they did for the Qing ruler, they were presented with the usual bounty that the Qing court always bestowed on these missions. And when this delegation from Siam, loaded down with gifts, were starting to make their way back to Guangzhou for the voyage home, they got assaulted and robbed en route somewhere in China. 
and everything was stolen. And after word of this incident made its way back to Bangkok, King Rama IV wasn't amused. And it got him thinking about how far China had fallen, clearly under the domination of the foreigners, unable to provide basic law and order in their own country. They had become this mere shell of their former greatness. The Froklong Ministry in Bangkok had to do some major readjustments in their foreign policy, particularly with respect to relations with foreign powers and with China. And the Siam court put their heads together and discussed what was more advantageous, to please the Qing emperor or please the Europeans. And besides, with all this chaos in China during the 1850s and 60s, the whole matter of sending tribute missions became a moot point, and all planned tribute missions were put on hold until finally... In 1882, under King Rama V, tribute trade missions to China were just done away with altogether. After all, what did it say about the Siamese monarchy bowing down to the Dongya Bingfu, the sick man of Asia? Starting with Rama IV, King Mangkut, the Siamese political winds started blowing in the direction of the European powers. Well, as it often is during times of great chaos in China, Going back to at least the Wu Hu Zhiluan, the invasions from the north of the so called Five Barbarians, uh, 304 to 316 CE, well, it wasn't uncommon for massive swaths of the population to just pick up and migrate to another, eh, hopefully safer part of China. In the case of the Hakka people, during this horrible fourth century disturbance in the north, they got up and left this ancestral homeland, Henan and Hubei mostly. And by the time they stopped running, they were all the way in Guangdong, Fujian, and various centers between Jiangxi and Guizhou. Back then, 4th century, buying passage on a boat and leaving the country for safer harbors wasn't an option yet. But now, mid-19th century, it was. And breakthroughs in navigation technologies, shipbuilding, and most important, with steam-powered vessels coming of age in the 1870s, now it was easy and convenient to pack up one's belongings and begin anew in a far-off land. And by this time in history, 19th century, so many Chinese pioneer immigrants had made that one-way voyage already. When this mightiest wave ever of Chinese emigration began to happen, these fortunate immigrants had the benefit of a mature cultural safety net already in place to give them comfort. Remember Rama III in the 1820s selling all those tax farming concessions and all these highest value, highest volume commodities? Well, like the tax man in George's song off Revolver, the crown was always on the prowl for new things to tax. And when the so-called Chinese vices, most notably opium, started getting regulated and taxed, well, let's just say, even though it had been outlawed since the time of Rama I, Opium was still widely used, mostly but not exclusively within the Chinese community. Illegal it may have been, but opium use was widespread enough whereby it was sitting there just asking to be taxed. In time, almost half of state revenues will come from opium and tax revenue raised from all these so-called Chinese vices. And all these immigrant laborers now coming over in waves, especially after 1882 when the Bangkok Passenger Steamer Company began regular service between Bangkok and Shanto. Well, by this time, there were about 8,400 Diochu Chinese a year taking that ride. By the turn of the century, almost 50,000 a year were following in the wake of these Diochus who had come before them. All this economic growth that had happened after Taksin the Great created a kind of dynamic whereby, no matter how much labor was imported from China, it was never enough. Sugarcane, after being introduced to the kingdom from China in 1810, had become a major commodity in Siam. And just as Chinese sailed by the thousands to Cuba to work the sugarcane fields, it was the same in Siam. Pepper, tin, all the kingdom's rich natural resources bounty... All of these agricultural and mining commodities, grown or dug out of the earth, required a lot of labor. And that 
insatiable demand became a magnet for Chinese immigrants, and as I said, not just in Thailand. Hey, and the five main linguistic groups who mostly made up Siam's ethnic Chinese, if they embarked on their journey from the port of Xiamen, they would seek out their fellow Hokkien when they got to their destination. If it was summoned from Meixian and Guangdong, north of the Chaoshan region, when they got to Siam, they sought out their Hakka kin. If you recall from past episodes, between 1855 and 1867, the Hakkas and Cantonese down in Guangdong province mostly fought a very bloody and violent war. Mandarin, it was known as the Tuke Shiedo, the Bunti Hakka clan wars. No one kept an accurate count, but almost a million souls lost their lives in this disturbance that lasted a dozen years. This upheaval led to a mass exodus of Hakka emigrants to all points in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. The same with the Cantonese from the Pearl River Delta region around Guangzhou. What the Diochus were to Siam, the Cantonese were to America. And to the local people in both countries, these particular immigrants became the face of all Chinese in their respective new lands. And the Hainanese, who geographically were the ones closest to Siam, and it probably wouldn't surprise you if I told you, they, they sort of stuck together too and formed their own communities in Siam. Because they were relative latecomers to Chinese emigration to Siam, by the time the Hainanese got there in any numbers the best places to farm or do business were already taken. So one of the things that sort of distinguished the immigrants from Hainan was that they were more than willing to wander into the hinterlands of the kingdom and settle there, making a life and achieving a different kind of success than their fellow Chinese in the cities and established coastal areas. And with Hainan having the kind of climate it did, surviving in the mountains and jungles of Siam, wasn't too much of a stretch for someone born and raised on the tropical island of Hainan. So they were particularly instrumental in opening up the parts of the Siamese countryside that hadn't been developed yet. And when regular steamer service started up between Hainan and Bangkok, well, you can imagine that helped to boost immigration from this group of ethnic Chinese. The Hokkien, on the other hand, they by and large stuck to the major trading ports of the kingdom. Prior to the destruction of Ayutthaya by the Burmese in 1767, they had made up the largest linguistic group of Chinese immigrants in the capital. The most celebrated and well-known stories of the Thai Chinese concern these these Huashang immigrants, the ones who were pillars of the Chinese communities they represented and made fortunes in commerce and industry. Compared to these luminaries... There aren't as many stories of these countless numbers of Hua Gong, or Chinese laborers, who came here. By and large, they came, married a local Siamese woman, and then their offspring, one or two generations later, were none the wiser as far as their Chinese heritage went. Like it is with a lot of people everywhere, not all Chinese in Siam lived apart from the general populace. The European languages of my grandparents didn't even last a generation after they came here, before we had all melted into the proverbial American pot. Prior to about mid-century, the 1850s, the Huashang, those ethnic Chinese involved in business, they made up the largest share of the immigrant population. But during the second half of the 19th century, overwhelmingly, The immigrants arriving in unprecedented numbers were made up of laborers. And just like the Toisan Chinese and their neighbors in the five surrounding counties did in the USA, the Chinese laborers who came to Siam looking for work also built railroads and thusly helped usher in all the modernization and advancement that railroads invariably brought with them in their wake. We're familiar with all the natural and man-made disasters of 19th century China that caused immigration to spike. That was true in a lot of cases. But in Siam, most of these newly arrived laborers were just, were just looking to make as much money as they could in this booming Siamese economy. And like so many others, their end game was to one day return to their village and live happily ever after, living off the income earned during their overseas adventure. With so many immigrants landing on Siamese shores and 
like I said, joining the communities where they felt most comfortable, of course, people who spoke their primary language, this kind of social dynamic was about as fertile an environment as you could get for the emergence of secret societies that grew to manage criminal organizations that regulated all the good things in life that the government outlawed. And with the most important thing in life at stake, that being money, sparks began to fly more often than usual, especially between the two linguistic groups with the most numerous members, that being the Diochus and the Hokkien, who each had their own secret societies that newly arrived immigrants would gravitate to. And these Chinese secret societies, or brotherhoods in Siam, I guess when it came right down to it, they offered eh, pretty much the same menu of products and services to their members as any benevolent association or secret society in the West might provide. But in Siam, they also took care of the vice trade, including opium, the most profitable vice of them all. Most of the secret societies began as innocuous self-help organizations for the newly arrived, replacing the family as the center of their lives. Then they became like a labor union until they devolved into the criminal organizations we all know and love. You see, going back to the Ayutthaya kingdom, the government had sort of adopted a policy that called for the Chinese to handle the Chinese. And so, with these secret societies, that was just one more manifestation of the Chinese looking after their own. And many would argue, also prey on their own. And if you think inter-gang rivalry got heated with so much money at stake, you guessed correct. The violence meted out by these secret societies got so bad, it became a major headache for the King of Siam and his government. Despite an edict from Rama III prohibiting the buying and selling, there was still plenty of opium to go around. He had no more luck stamping out the opium trade than his luckless counterpart in the Forbidden City in Beijing. And no one single linguistic group dominated trade and distribution. In varying degrees, anyone who was willing to risk it all could themselves get in the opium business. By the time of Rama IV, King Mankut, he knew he couldn't beat City Hall, so he was the one who came up with the idea to just regulate opium. He kept the prohibition on using opium enforced amongst the majority Thai populace. But as for the ethnic Chinese and this particular <clears throat> Chinese vice, the Crown sold off licenses to grow and produce opium exclusively for the home market. That yielded a heck of a lot of revenue for the Treasury. And at the same time, with the domestic market already well served by Siamese organizations, there was less dependence on traders in Penang and elsewhere for supply. The foreign imported mud would have to fight a price war with the domestic Siamese opium suppliers, which is a business model most merchants try to avoid. The system wasn't perfect, but it kept the scourge under control. A description of the activities that the secret societies in Siam were involved in would be familiar to anyone who has studied the Hong Kong triads and the tongs of New York and San Francisco Chinatowns. Many aspects were common to all secret societies and brotherhoods. The Siamese government always lived in constant dread of secret societies colluding with foreigners against the ruling class. The Chakri dynasty had a peculiar relationship with their ethnic Chinese subjects. On the one hand, they benefited greatly from their industry and hard work in serving the monarchy and the country. But ever since the fall of Taksin, who showed so much favor on the Chinese, particularly the Diochus, being one himself on his father's side, the Chakri rulers couldn't bring themselves to fully trust them. The secret societies were everywhere, but mostly prevalent up and down the Malay Peninsula. Many of these gangs had their start in Penang and crept northward, opening up branches across the border in Siam. In Chinese, they were called Gongsi or Gongsi in Mandarin. The Siamese called them Angyi, and they were everywhere. I'd love to regale you with all kinds of interesting facts about them, but it seems no matter where we all come from, for those of us familiar with organized crime, in 19th century Siam, 
They control the same rackets as their fellow parasites all over the world. Organizing labor, breaking strikes, construction, muscle labor, gambling, booze, and opium. And prostitution, too. I assure you, the stories are surely fascinating about the secret societies of Siam. Generally speaking, there were three things about the secret societies that made the monarchy uneasy. First of all, they were, in general, anti-monarchy and anti-establishment. They were loyal to their brotherhood, not to the king. Before the Xinhai Revolution in China, Sun Yat-sen himself had made a few visits to Bangkok, and his supporters there were many. Sun had even set up a branch of the Tongmeng Hui there, and he had famously referred to the overseas Chinese as, quote, the mother of the revolution. Both Sun's organization and the Ang Yi shared a lot in common, anti-monarchical feelings among them, which did not endear them to the Chakri dynasty. So the Ang Yi became a long-term problem for the Siamese government, who will time and again try different ways to rein them in, just enough to not let their illegal activities cause any hardship for the government. In the next episode, we'll look at how these Ang Yi start to become a real threat to the government and a menace to society. Regardless of the dangers they represented, the kings of Siam would often find uses for these Ang Yi. In the end, the government had a nifty idea about how to handle them. We'll get to that in part six, perhaps. If you've had too many sleepless nights, tossing and turning, wondering how you can help support this long-running family program and keep it from falling into oblivion, you can subscribe to my Patreon at patreon.com backslash China History Podcast. Three bucks, two and a half euros, 27 Norwegian krona. Early access to episodes have a bunch of wacky stories already posted from my 35 years in the biz, flooding the shelves of the U.S. mass retail market with made-in-China stuff. If I put these stories on this RSS feed, I'd be defrocked. Or if you just want to toss a few shillings in my worn paper cup, I keep a CHP begging bowl 24-7 at paypal.me backslash China History Podcast. If you didn't have a pen handy, go to the episode at teacup.media. I wrote it all down for you. Okay, that's it for this time. This is Laszlo Montgomery, still going strong after more than a decade in this unforgiving and competitive history podcasting industry. You think it's easy competing with the likes of Dan Carlin, Ray Harris Jr., and the History Chicks? It's rough out there. Please please me, and don't walk away just yet. Let's make a date to meet back in a mere two weeks' time for what's already shaping up to be another exciting episode of the China History Podcast. But actually, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you won't have to wait two weeks. Take care, everyone.